Hello, this is Life Questions, a program that is committed to providing biblical perspective to the many issues of life that we all face. And as we tape this program today, there are many concerns that we face. On the global scene, of course, there is the coronavirus. Nationally and locally, we see that that virus has even contaminated our stock market and the economy. But in the meantime, we here at TV44 sense from your letters of concern that there are still day-to-day -day issues of life that confront you. And we want to deal with as much of those issues as possible on today's program. We have invited a panel of local ministers to give us some biblical perspective on your questions, and I'd like to introduce them to you at this time. First of all, we have Dr. Timothy White of Lima First Missionary Church, followed by Pastor Brad Taylor of the Lima Community Church. Then there's Pastor Chris Ewing of the County Line Church of the Brethren. And rounding off our panel is Pastor Jonathan Hanover of the Kenton First United Methodist Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you back on today's program. Thank you. Good, to be back. Good discussion last week. And um, another very captivating issue that we have to deal with today this is a letter that came in from one of our viewers stating, two years ago, I was in an auto accident that left me paralyzed. I can no longer work and I have to rely on my mom for care. I want to know what did I do to deserve this? Why is God punishing me for this? Um, this, you, you can multiply this feeling by any number you want. There are a lot of people that feel that their circumstances are really the result of God putting something on them to punish them. How do you, how do you address this type of thing? Yeah, that's a question that as pastors we all have dealt with, certainly. And, you know, there are a lot of different perspectives even within Christianity on what role God plays in suffering and in, um, you know, the, the circumstances, the, the different issues that we face. Um, you know, probably just first of all, just to address the the pain that this person is is mm -hmm. is experiencing, and and understanding that, um, you know, I, I would hope this person has some uh, some Christian influence in their life that could come alongside and and journey with them through this as they wrestle with some of these questions. Um, but you know, the the um, the position that that many of us take as Christians is that. Uh, that God is not the, the one who causes these things and that God, in, in fact, does not punish uh, in this particular way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in many ways, this is part of sort of a, a bad reputation that I think God has, that mm -hmm. he's responsible for um, calamity or for uh, even personal issues like this young, young person is going through. Um, and just that, that pastoral presence in their lives to just say to them that, um, you know, this is, this is not God's way of punishing you for something that you've done or something that somebody in your family has done. You know, in, in, in Exodus, when God uh, identifies himself to Moses, he talks about his love and his compassion and his mercy. And, um, you know, there's, there's some nuances there in the original language, but just the reality that, um, that those things go for, for, from generation to generation, yes. you know, and, and that that's the character of God, that, that we don't believe God causes such things to happen to people. They're, they're the product of a fallen and broken world that we live in. And, and I think there's not enough emphasis on that latter part of your statement that, that it, it is the product of a fallen world that we live in. Um, these kinds of catastrophes didn't exist prior to that. God even gets a bad rap when there's a tornado or there's a hurricane, or, uh, a hurricane I should say. Uh, we very often call that an act of God. And it is not an act of God. Right. Well, in insurance you know, language, if something yeah. falls off of a car in front of you and it hits you, and they, you know, they, they call that an act of God. So <laughs> it very much goes into our culture and our language of anything outside of our control it tends to be an act of God, which is just not true. Um, yeah, the whole fallen world thing, it, it is interesting when you take it from that perspective because, you know, we are not designed to last forever anymore. Um, we, are, we are, you know, creatures that need to die and actually death is actually a blessing. Um, in Genesis, when, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, it, it talks about that um, God didn't want them to live forever. And so he, he took them away from the tree of life so that they would experience death. Why? So that he could redeem them and, and have relationship with, with his creation again. 
you know, for this person, you know, I, I honestly, you know, hope that, you know, right now during this taping and, and during the airing that, that this person just feels the, the blessing of God upon them right now. Um, you know, that, that, that God can break through what, what, whatever their thoughts are ab about their situation. And, and the truth is, is that none of us here can explain why this happened to them. Only God can. And, but what I try and, and tell people is, is that, you know, there just needs to be a perspective switch in this. And to ask the question of, you're in this situation and you're not going to be able to change it. And so then the question then becomes not why did God allow this to happen, but God, what can you teach me? What can you um, have me learn through this? How can you bring me closer to you through this? And, and a good example of that in scripture is Job. Um, Job lost everything. Um, and we even find out that, that God allowed all that to happen, that, that God didn't do it, but he allowed it to happen to him. Um, Job lost all of his kids. Now, us as Christians, we like to look at the end of that story and say, well, Job got everything back in tenfold, right? Yeah. But he never got his original kids back. No. He continued mm. to have to mourn them for the rest of his life. And so his situation, yes, it got better, but it never changed from the, of the loss that he had actually had. And so that's what I would say with, the, with this person is, is that your situation can change from, from God coming into your life and really allowing him to speak. So I would challenge them to just take time and just to, to pray and not only pray and, and ask those hard conversations. If you, if you read through Job, Job has hard conversations with God. Moses, if you read Moses, Moses is face to face and, and, and has genuine, um, intense conversations with yeah. God. I encourage that. Have those conversations, but then take time to listen. Allow God to speak. Allow God to, to um, pour into your life so that you can move beyond this and become the person that God really designed you to be, even in your broken state. You know, I, I, I uh, can give a personal testimony on this. Just recently, within the last two months, uh, my wife lost a nephew of hers. When he was seven years old, he was um, coming out of the school, going to the bus, and he was hit by a car. And the damage was so great, the injuries were so great, he became a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. That is, <clears throat> of course, paralyzed from the neck down. And he lived for 20 years, died at age 27, just about two or three months ago. But the way his family surrounded him, Christian family surrounded him, and his aunts and uncles and everybody, and gave him uh, such great encouragement. He began to develop a Christian magazine, a Christian comic book and those kinds of things. And the Lord blessed him even in that state until his death. Uh, and it, I think it, it has to do with the quality of life issue for, and I just found out somebody in the control room just told me this man, this was a man in his early 40s, a young man in his early 40s, that he, he needs to be surrounded by some Christian people who can help love him and minister to him, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the people yeah. that are gifted in mercy. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the biblical gift of mercy is actually being able to, you know, meet with somebody right where they are. And even though their situation never changes to bring them into a fullness of Christ, not just to have a pity party with them, not just to say, oh, I'm so sorry, but to actually take them on a journey to bring them back to Christ. And, and you know, if you know this person, if anybody knows this person and, and is gifted that way or knows something, we just need to speak life to them. We need to encourage them. We need to build them up and not allow uh, the enemy to get in there and, and speak death. Yeah. Pastor Hanover, do you know of any personal incidences uh, that you can bring to play or, or any general comment? Yeah, I, I just want to say that um, there probably is no answer that we can give right now that answers the question of why. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the question of why is really overrated anyways. Yeah. Um, because even if we know why, that doesn't necessarily bring peace. Uh, but I think it's worth remembering that God did not necessarily promise that we would be free of suffering. God promised to be with us. And in the incarnation, Jesus took on human weakness and human pain. And so this person that's suffering, you don't suffer alone. God is, the God is there with you. Um, so you may not have an answer to why, and I agree that we need to have people that come around because some of these questions and some of these issues are not things that can be answered in a moment. They take years and sometimes only in hindsight are, are, are seen. Um, but just know that God is still with you, that you are still a, a, a child of God and someone of, of great worth made in the image of God. 
Yeah. And even in the suffering, that is a suffering that you don't, that God is not immune to. Yeah. I'm personally touched by the viewer's question. And we had to say goodbye to a 19-year-old son killed in an automobile accident. And so your, many times, your son? No. Correct, ours. And so many times I wish that he had only been injured mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even paralyzed, that we had the physical him right. still there. Right. But wouldn't that be the epitome of selfishness? Mm. Uh, it, it really would. I would love to invite that viewer or anyone who had a question why in, in, in these circumstances to, uh, to go to uh, the Billy Graham website and, and just search a story about Becky, who was a school teacher that through a stroke, she became paralyzed as well. She had a full life. She was a, a school teacher going to work every day and suddenly everything changed like the viewer had indicated that happened to, 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 the, to them. And uh, God eventually gave Becky peace in her heart and in her mind. In fact, in an interview with Becky, she cited Romans 8.28, how all things work together for good mm -hmm. for those who love God. And that doesn't mean bad things in life are good. Mm -hmm. She said, I, I, I believe the stroke was a bad thing, but I have right. seen God bring so many good things out of this. And, and I really feel privileged, she said, uh, to share in his work. I, uh, she looked at it as a life change, and it is not a punishment. It's a life change. She was able to reach and connect with people that others had no hope of ever connecting with through health care, people who, who ministered to her and, and, and uh, treated her. And she was able to find the joy of her salvation even in the midst of her crisis. I'm not saying or even pretending that it's going to happen immediately or it's, it's a process. God will and he can give you that peace? Did, 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 did you ask the question why of when course. you lost your 19 year old son? Of, yeah. of course. And even if I understand, I mean, even, even if God came down himself and <laughs> said, this is why, yeah. I don't know that in my humanity I would ever understand it. Mm -hmm. So I realized why is not my question? My question is how? How do I respond now? How, how do I pick up the pieces how do we venture from here? And it, it is a daily walk. It is a five minute walk sometimes. It's not, victory doesn't come three years from now when I'm finished grieving and I've accepted that. That's not when victory comes. Victory comes today when I'm able to say, God, I don't understand. I need your help and I submit to allowing you to help me. Yeah. Then I receive victory. Yeah, incredible, incredible. You know, Pastor Tim, I, um, I think of Joseph in the Old Testament oh, and, and just the, the trials that he faced, you know? And, and so I would, just as you encourage this viewer or anybody with a question in this vein to visit the website and, and see Becky's testimony, um, you know, read, read the biographical story of Joseph in, in the book of Genesis, just yeah. the longest biography in the Old Testament, <laughs> you know, 20, 20 plus chapters. And, you know, if you know the story, all the things that happen to Joseph, the, the many uh, bad decisions that others make that affect him. And, and yet in Genesis 50, Joseph has this, this brilliant statement, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, where he says, what you intended for evil, God used for good. And, yes. you know, the, you, you mentioned it, Pastor Chris, but the, the reality is God is a redeemer. And God is, even though we live in a fallen world, God is restoring that world and That's redeeming right. that world and mm -hmm. making that world new. And that is true. Uh, like, I, I just want to speak to the camera, to the viewers and yes. say that is true of, of us, that God is making us new. And, and you know, again, in, in the Lent season, right, this is <laughs> one of the things that we recognize and celebrate. I want to make sure that the viewer understands that we legitimize your, 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 your feelings. For sure. They are legitimate. They are right. real. We don't mean to undermine them or minimize right. them in any way. And they're normal. Yeah. These are normal. You're not some exception. Yeah. Uh, these are very normal human responses to life change and For sudden sure. abrupt life change. Sure. Uh, I, just, I, I just surround you with, with, with my prayers um, and encouragement that God can make a way and make a difference in your life where he can use you just the way you are and he still loves you just the way you are and has a plan for your life just the way you are. That's right. And it's a dynamic plan. It's not just a plan that is 
you know, just small. I mean, his plan for each and every single one of his creations is huge. That's so true. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, I'd, I'd like to change the subject. We've got some other questions that have come in from viewers, one dealing with abortion. I think it will surprise you to see the changing trend in thought among Christians mm -hmm. about abortion. Mm -hmm. And we also want to deal with what did Christ really mean when he said you've got to hate your mother and your father? Is that what he really meant? <laughs> we'll deal with that more when we return. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Thank you for staying with us. Some interesting things happening in the area of abortion. I want to just read you this, um, a letter that we got. Uh, how can Christians say abortion is murder when scientists tell us that life doesn't begin until birth? Now, meanwhile, there's a recent study from Pew Research uh, that shows how many Christians feel about abortion. Each of you gentlemen have a, a copy of that. It's interesting to see that when we break this down by the various denominations, Southern Baptist Convention, it says 30% 30, 30 in favor of abortion. Mm -hmm. Assemblies of God, 26%. Let's get to some of the higher numbers. Presbyterian Church in America, 54% in favor of abortion. Lutheran Synagogue, the Missouri Synod, 46% in favor of abortion. Episcopal Church, 79% in favor. And, and this list just goes on and on to some of the other denominations that you would know about. What's changed here? What's made for this change? What, what's going on, gentlemen? Uh, anybody have any idea? I think part of it is the way that the question is phrased. The question was phrased, should abortion be legal? And some of that is the changing views of the way that our government should play, uh, which I think has two aspects. One of which is many people feel that we live in a pluralistic society where there's a lot of different faiths mm -hmm. and we shouldn't impose. And they think the other side is a saying of we don't trust the government to impose um, moral sorts of questions. And so I think those both kind of play into that as well. Um, the idea of is it even if whether or not we believe it's right, do we believe the government should play a role then in regulating that? Mm -hmm. And more specifically to that Supreme Court decision of uh, this, uh, January 22nd of 1973, when, of course, abortion was made legal in this country. Um, but we have always thought, uh, I'll go to you, we have always thought that most Christians were not in favor of abortion. And we're seeing numbers, even among those Christians who had spoken out against abortion, now have some high percentages in favor of. What does that say? It, it, it doesn't surprise me. Does it? it, it no, no, not really. Um, because, um, first of all, what is our standard for truth? Mm -hmm. That's the question. And not everyone in the Christian circle holds the same standard for truth. Mm -hmm. For me, my standard for truth is the very word of God. Some Christians say abortion is murder because God demonstrates to us in his word that life begins with conception and not birth. It, it tells me very clearly, Psalm 139, mm -hmm. 13 through 16, David wrote, you brought, listen to this, it's, it's, it's so interesting. You brought my inner parts into being. You wove me, he said me, in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and you know me completely. My frame was not hidden from you when I was in the secret place and intricately put together. In his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Your eyes saw me when I was unformed. Yet in your book, all my days were written even before any of them came into being. In other words, you credited life to me even before I was born. Even before science said that I was a person you called me by name. Mm -hmm. So, well, speaking of by name, God told Jeremiah 
before you entered the belly, yeah. I knew you. Mm. And when you came forth, I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. God didn't wait for Jeremiah to go off to be in seminary school before he ordained him. He ordained <laughs> him when he was a fetus that's in right. his mother's womb. Right. Yes, but see that Psalm passage, I think what's more interesting than, than, than most of the, those scriptures is, is the end part of that, is that God formed you when all your days were written in that book. Mm -hmm. So he already knew your entire life. Sure, mm -hmm. He knew all the good things you would do, all the bad things you would do, <laughs> all the mistakes you would make, yeah. all the hurts that you would do. Mm -hmm. And he still chose to create you yes. before all that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, for me, that's a big part. If, if God is creating somebody before, with the full knowledge of their entire life, before they're born, uh -huh then life begins then at conception mm -hmm. with a full life planned out. And that's huge for me personally, and it should be for the church. Yes. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, it's translation, translating out is that the church has not done a good job. We as the body of Christ has not done a good job communicating these thoughts and beliefs. I believe that those in support, uh, support of abortion have done a very good job. Um, they, they've communicated their stance, they have driven it home, um, they have done it good and in bad ways, but either way, that is the view that you hear all the time is, you know, choice, 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 abortion, abortion, abortion. Um, you don't really hear a whole lot of why, why is God a life person? Like why did God design it to be this way? Why does life begin at conception? We just hear that, well, Christians would believe that life begins at conception. Not, not why, not the um, standpoint of this, but the other side has done a very good job of doing the, well, I believe in abortion because of mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it is, is our fault is that we as a church, and we have failed in many different ways, not just in this, but we have failed to guide the culture in, in God's ways instead of man's ways. Well, this is, uh, I, it, it was shocking to me to, to see these statistics. And I, I guess what you're saying is that over time, because our voice has been more on the silent side, the other side has become more dominant, which means that as Christians, we have a great work to do and need to do that. The Supreme Court, which made that decision that, that uh, legalized abortion, has been wrong on other cases. Somebody pointed out around here just a little sure. while ago. Sure. When slavery was legal, um, yeah. that, that was overturned. Yes. Other issues that need to be overturned, but it won't happen if we don't speak out. And I don't mean that we need to be militant, try to jam the gospel down other people's right. throats and that kind of thing. But we need to convey, we need to communicate the gospel. Be Isn't consistent that with it. Be, be consistent, consistent with, with the word of God and we don't have to worry about it. Well, it. I, I'm a follower of Christ, you know, so for moral issues, the government does not tell me what is right is wrong. God does through his word. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge misunderstanding. Like when, when, when the government says, well, this is legal now, well, then it's okay. No. Just because the government says it's okay does not mean that God says it's okay. And that's, that's a big thing that we, you know, need to, to make sure that everybody um, knows. But a lot of times because of the Christian roots, the religious roots that we've had as a, as a nation, they've mirrored, you know, throughout, you know, the decades, the centuries. And so there's that mixture now. So we're just looking for somebody to validate our sin in, in some ways, right? It doesn't matter what sin it is, if it's gossip, lying, whatever, you know, we want somebody to validate it. So when we can get the government to validate it, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. well, then that must be right. If the government says it's right, if the, gov if the Supreme Court decision comes down or an edict from the president's office or a congressional mandate, then yeah. it must be right. Then yeah, we can do it. and that's a dangerous place to be in. Well, another issue that's going like that would be marijuana. Yeah which is legal in, um, I think, some 14, 15 states. And in some other states, they have already decriminalized it. So you've got about half the country that looks the other way when it comes to marijuana. And people are now saying that that makes it okay to do that. When, in fact, there is no right way to do wrong. Am I right? Right. Mm, that's right. <laughs> There's a difference between science and scientists. Uh -huh. God is the author of science. Yes, he is. Scientists have opinions, hypotheses. They have, they have educated guesses 
or lack thereof. <laughs> they can't even get, some of them can't, the scientists can't even get past the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, that God created all things. Mm -hmm. They can't even get past that, Pastor yeah. Brad. So, so why would we lend credence to anything that they have to say that is contrary or would be antithetical to the Word? We yeah. often present science as being undisputed and clear in answers. But that's also not the case as well. Science, relatively speaking, born out of the Enlightenment, is a relatively new field of study, and it is evolving, and it is changing. It is. So to put our foot down and say science says this is also kind of a rough place to be because <clears throat> science is evolving and may say something very different in yes. a short amount of time. We've seen that happen uh, a lot in the last few decades. Yeah. Well, I mean, scientists, like, like you said, they don't agree. But, I mean, even if you go with, you know, um, through Genesis 1, you can see science clear through it. You can see when God yes. created the atmosphere, yes. when God created gravity, when God created, you know, all these different aspects. You know, yes, it doesn't say the word gravity, but, but when he says that, you know, all the water receded down into the low, well, what do you think happened? Yeah. That God yeah. created, you know, all these different aspects of science um, in these places. And so the scripture actually is filled with science all, all over the place and, 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 and allows God to be in, in the center of it all. Um, so it's just, it's just very interesting when, when we have these debates on, on science, I usually go to the back, yeah, science is right. However, God created the science, just like what you're saying, and that, that God is the one that put those things into motion, not just some random event. When so Paul tells us in the book of Romans, first chapter, that man is without an excuse because all he need to yes. do is look around him yes. to they, see the creation. The creation the, speaks for itself. In the Psalms, there is yes. intelligent design. The Big Bang has, yes. <laughs> no, things <laughs> yeah. don't just come together, you know. Yeah. But no. Let, no. let's cut that short. In the one minute or so we have yeah. left, there's this person <laughs> that wrote in talking, the, the scripture in um, Luke 14, 28, sorry, 6, where, uh, where the Lord says, you know, and, and, and you've got to hate your mother and you hate your father. This is the way it's put, and, and, and seeming to think that because of that, God wants us to hate our parents and to love him only. The verse says, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his own father and mother in the sense of indifference and, and regard, that he, he's not my disciple. Um, but that's not what it really means, is it? No, God can't do anything that contradicts what God means. 45 seconds, by the way. Okay. <laughs> he can't do it. Uh, God can't be dishonest or unjust because that would contradict his, his truthfulness. The Trinity cannot disagree. They have to be in complete agreement to say to use that word hate, it means maybe to prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, Jacob, I loved. Esau, I hated. Uh, meaning that uh, Esau, you know, I have preferred Jacob over Esau, not hated mm -hmm. Esau in the terms that we think hate. hate right. might be. Well, the Greek right. yeah, and the Greek definition tells you that it means prefer. Pre okay. When well, you look at the when you look at it in the yep. Greek, the original Greek writing, yep. of course, at that time. Well, that's we want to make sure we got that in okay. for the viewer that wrote that in. <laughs> We're all out of time, but we want to thank you very much for your very, very uh, good expertise on today's program and shedding light on so many things. That's our program for today. We, of course, will be back again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.